দি ট্রাস্ট প্রপার্টি বৃন্দাবন কুন্ডু কেম টু হিজ ফাদার ইন আ রেজ অ্যান্ড সেড আই এম অফ দিস মোমেন্ট অনগ্রেটফুল রিচ স্নেড দি ফাদার জগন্নাথ কুন্ডু when you have paid me back all that i have spent on your food and clothing it will be time enough to give yourself these aids such food and clothing as was customary in jagannath's household could not have cost very much our rishis of old managed to feed and clothe themselves on an incredibly small outlay jagannath's behavior showed that his ideal in these respects was equally high that he could not fully live up to it was due partly to the bad influence of the degenerate society around him and partly to certain unreasonable demands of nature in her attempt to keep body and soul together so long as brindavan was single things went smoothly enough but after his marriage he began to depart from the high and rare fire standard cherished by his set it was clear that the son's ideas of comfort were moving away from the spiritual to the material and imitating the ways of the world he was unwilling to put up with the discomforts of heat cold thirst and hunger his minimum of food and clothing rose a pace frequent were the quarrels between the father and the son at last brindavan's wife became seriously ill and a kobiraj was called in but when the doctor prescribed a costly medicine for his patient jagannath took it as a proof of sheer incompetence and turned him out immediately at first brindavan besought his father to allow the treatment to continue then he quarreled with him about it but to no purpose when his wife died he abused his father and called him a murderer nonsense said the father don't people die even after swallowing all kinds of drugs if costly medicines could save life how is it that kings and the emperors are not immortal you don't expect your wife to die with more pomp and ceremony than did your mother and your grandmother before her do you brindavan might really have derived a great consolation from these words had he not been overwhelmed with grief and incapable of proper thinking neither his mother nor his grandmother had taken any medicine before making their exit from this world and this was the time honored custom of the family but alas the younger generation was unwilling to die according to ancient custom the english had newly come to the country at the time we speak of even in those remote days the good old folks were horrified at the unorthodox ways of the new generation and sat speechless trying to draw comfort from their hookahs be that as it may the modern brindavan said to his old foggy of a father i am off the father instantly agreed and wished publicly that should he ever give his son one single paisa in future the gods might recon his act as shedding the holy blood of cows brindavan in his turn similarly wished that should he ever accept anything from his father his act might be hailed as bad as matricide the people of the village looked upon this small revolution as a great relief after a long period of monotony and when jagannath disinherited his only son everyone did his best to console him all were unanimous in the opinion that to quarrel with a father for the sake of a wife was possible only these degenerate days and the reason they gave was sound too when your wife dies they said you can find a second one without delay but when your father dies you cannot get another to replace him for love or money 
nor did separation from Vrindavan weigh heavily on the mind of his father. In the first place, his absence from home reduced the household expenses. Then again, the father was freed from a great anxiety. The fear of being poisoned by his son and hair had always haunted him. When he ate his scanty fare, he could never banish the thought of poison from his mind. This fear had abated somewhat after the death of his daughter-in-law. And now that the sun was gone, it disappeared altogether. But there was one tender spot in the old man's heart. Brindabon had taken away with him his four-year-old son Gokul Chantro. Now the expense of keeping the child was comparatively small and so Jagunna's affection for him was without a drawback. Still, when Brindavan took him away, his grief, sincere as it was, was mingled at first with calculation as to how much he would save a month by the absence of the two, how much the sum would come to in the year, and what would be the capital to bring it in as interest. But the empty house without Gokul Chandra in it to make mischief became more and more difficult for the old man to live in. There was no one now to play tricks upon him when he was engaged in his puja, no one to snatch away his food and eat it, no one to run away with his ink pot when he was writing up his accounts. His daily routine of life, now uninterrupted, became an intolerable burden to him. He bethought him that this unworried peace was endurable only in the world to come. When he caught sight of the holes made in his quilt by his grandchild and the pen and ink sketches executed by the same artist on his rush mat, his heart was heavy with grief. Once upon a time he had reproached the boy bitterly because he had torn his dhoti into pieces within the short space of two years. Now tears stood in Jagannath's eyes as he gazed upon the dirty remnants lying in the bedroom. He carefully put them away in his safe and registered a vow that should Kokul ever come back again, he should not be reprimanded even if he destroyed one dhoti a year. But Gokul did not return, and poor Jagannath aged rapidly. His empty home seemed emptier every day. No longer could the old man stay peacefully at home. Even in the middle of the day, when all respectable folks in the village enjoyed their after-dinner siesta, Jagannath might be seen roaming over the village, hookah in hand. The boys, at sight of him, would give up their play and retiring in a body of a safe distance chant verses composed by a local poet praising the old gentleman's economical habits. No one ventured to say his real name, lest he should have to go without his meal that day. And so people gave him names after their own fancy. Elderly people called him Jagannash. But the reason why the younger generation preferred to call him a vampire was hard to guess. It may be that the bloodless, dried up skin of the old man had some physical resemblance to the vampires. One afternoon when Jagannath was rambling as usual through the village lane shaded by mango tops, he saw a boy, apparently a stranger, assuming the captaincy of the village boys and explaining to them the scheme of some new prank owned by the force of his character and the starting novelty of his ideas, the boys had all shown allegiance to him. Unlike the others, he did not run away from the old man as he approached, but came quite close to him and began to shake with him. The result was that a live lizard sprang out of it onto the old man's body, ran down his back and off towards the jungle. Sudden fright made the poor man shiver from head to foot, to the great amusement of the other boys, who shouted with glee. 
before Jagannath had gone far cursing and swearing, the gamcha of his shoulder suddenly disappeared, and the next moment it was seen on the head of the new boy, transformed into a turban. The novel attentions of this mannequin came as a great relief to Jagannath. It was long since any boy had taken such freedom with him. After a good deal of coaxing and many fair promises, he at last pursued the boy to come to him. What's your name, my boy? Nitai Pal. Where's your home? Aunt Tail. Who's your father? Aunt Tail. Why aren't you? Because I have run away from home. Mm, and what made you do it? My father wanted to send me to school. It occurred to Jagannath that it would be useless extravagance to send such a boy to school, and his father must have been an unpractical fool not to have thought so. Well, well, said Jagannath, how would you like to come and stay with me? Don't mind, said the boy, and forthwith he installed himself in Jagannath's house. He felt as little hesitation as though it were the shadow of a tree by the wayside, and not only that, he began to proclaim his wishes as regards his food and clothing with such coolness that you would have thought he had paid his reckoning in full beforehand. And when anything went wrong, he did not hesitation to quarrel with the old man. It had been easy enough for Jagannath to get the better of his own child. But now, where another man's child was concerned, he had to acknowledge defeat. The people of the village marveled when Nitai Pal was unexpectedly made so much of by Jagannath. They felt sure that the old man's end was near and the prospect of his charge all his property to this unknown lad made their hearts sore. Furious with envy, they determined to do the boy an injury, but the old man took care of him as though he was a rib in his breast. At times the boy threatened that he would go away, and the old man used to say to him temptingly, I will leave you all the property, I promise. Young as he was, the boy fully understood the grandeur of this promise. The village people then began to make inquiries after the father of the boy. Their hearts melted with compassion for the agonist parents, and they declared that the son must be a rascal to cause them so much suffering. They heaped abuses on his head, but the heat with which they did it betrayed envy rather than a sense of justice. One day the old man learned from a wayfarer that one Damodar Pal was seeking his lost son, and was even now coming towards the village. Nitai, when he heard this, became very restless and was ready to run away leaving his future will to take care of itself. Jagannath reassured him, saying, I mean to hide you where nobody can find you, not even the village people themselves. The skin, the curiosity of the boy, and said, Oh, where? Do show me? People will know if I show you now. Wait till it is night, said Jagannath. The hope of discovering the mysterious hiding place delighted Nitai. He planned to himself how, as soon as his father had gone away without him, he would have a bed with his comrades and play hide and seek. Nobody would be able to find him. Would not it be fun? His father too would ransack the whole village and not find him that would be rare fun also. At noon, Jagannath shut the boy up in his house and disappeared for some time. When he came back home, Nitai worried him with questions. No sooner was it dark, then Nitai said, Grandfather, shall we go now? It is not night yet, replied Jagannath. 
A little while later, the boy exclaimed, It is night now. Grandfather, come, let's go. The village people have not gone to bed yet, whispered Jagannath. Nitai waited but a moment and said, They have gone to bed now, Grandfather. I am sure they have. Let's start now. The night advanced. Sleep began to weigh heavily on the eyelids of the poor boy, and it was a hard struggle for him to keep awake. At midnight, Jagannath caught hold of the boy's arm and left the house, dropping through the dark lanes of the sleeping village. Not a sound disturbed the stillness except the occasional howl of a dog when all the other dogs far and near would join in chorus, or perhaps the flapping of a night bird, scared by the sound of human footsteps at the unusual hour. Nitai trembled with fear and held Jagannath fast by the arm. Across many a field they went and at last came to a jungle where stood a dilapidated temple without a god in it. What here? exclaimed Nitai in a tone of disappointment. It was nothing like what he had imagined. There was not such mystery about it. Often since running away from home, he had passed nights in deserted temples like this. It was not a bad place for playing hide and seek, Still, it was quite possible that his comrades might track him here. From the middle of the floor inside, Jagannath removed a slab of stone, and an underground room with a lamp burning in it was revealed to the astonished eyes of the boy. Fear and curiosity fall in his little heart. Jagannath descended by a ladder, and Nitai followed him. Looking round, the boy saw that were Gharash on all sides of him. In the middle lay spread an ashun, and in front of were arranged vermilion sandal paste, flowers, and other articles of puja. To satisfy his curiosity, the boy dipped his hand into some of the Gharas and drew out their contents. They were rupees and gold mohors. Jagannath, addressing the boy, said, I told you, Nitai, that I would give you all my money. I have not got much. These khadas are all that I promise. These I will make over to you today. The boy jumped with delight. All! he exclaimed. You won't take back a rupee, will you? If I do, said the old man in solemn tones. May my hand be attacked with leprosy, but that is one condition. If ever my grandson Gokul Chandra, or his son, or his grandson, or his great grandson, or any of his progeny should happen to pass this way, then you must make over to him or to them every rupee and every mohor hair. The boy thought that the old man was raving. Very well, he replied. Then sit on this ashon, said Jagannath. What for? Because puja will be done to you. But why? said the boy, taken aback. This is the rule. The boy squatted on the ashon as he was told. Jagannath smeared his forehead with sandal paste, put a mark of vermilion between his eyebrows, flung a garland of flowers round his neck, and began to recite mantras. To sit there like a god and hear mantras recited made poor Nitai feel very uneasy. Grandfather, he whispered, but Jagannath did not reply and went on murmuring his incantations. Finally, with great difficulty, he dragged each ghora before the boy and made him repeat the following bow after him. I do solemnly promise that I will make over all this treasure to Gokul Chandra Kundu, the son of Brindaban Kundu, the grandson of Jagannath Kundu, or to the son or to the grandson, or to the great-grandson of the said Gokul Chandra Kundu, or to any other progeny of his who may be the rightful head. 
The boy repeated this over and over again until he felt amazed and his tongue began to grow stiff in his mouth. When the ceremony was over, the air of the cave was laden with the smoke of the earthen lamp and the breath poison of the two. The boy felt that the roof of his mouth had become dry as dust and his hands and feet were burning. He was nearly suffocated. The lamp became dimmer and dimmer and then went out altogether. In the total darkness that followed, Nithai could hear the old man climbing up the ladder. Grandfather, where are you going to? said he, greatly distressed. I am going now, replied Jagunnath. You remain here. No one will be able to find you. Remember the name Gokul Chandra, the son of Brindavan and the grandson of Jagannath. He then withdrew the letter. In a stifled, agonist voice, the boy implored, I want to go back to father. Jagannath replaced the slab. He then knelt down and placed his ear on the stone. Nitai's voice was heard once more. Father! And then came a sound of some heavy object falling with a bump, and then everything was still. Having thus placed his wealth in the hands of Yag, Jagannath began to cover up the stone with earth. Then he piled broken bricks and loose mortar over it, on the top of all the planted turfs and jungle weeds. The night was almost spent, but he could not tear himself away from the spot. Now and again he placed his ear to the ground and tried to listen. It seemed to him that from far, far below, from the unfathomable depth of the earth's interior, came a wailing. It seemed to him that the night sky was flooded with that one sound, that the sleeping humanity of all the world was awake and was sitting on its bed trying to listen. The old man in his frenzy kept on heaping earth higher and higher. He wanted somehow to stuffle that sound, but still he fancied he could hear father. He struck the spot with all his might and said, Be quiet, people might hear you. But still he imagined he heard Father, the sun lighted up the eastern zone. Jagannath then left the temple and came into the open fields. There, too, somebody called out, Father, startled at the sound. He turned back and saw his son at his heels. Father, said Brindaban, I hear my boy is hiding himself in your house. I must have him back. With eyes dilated and distorted mouth, the old man leaned forward and exclaimed, Your boy? Yes, my boy Gokul. He is Nitai Pal now, and I myself go by the name of Damodar Pal. Your fame has spread so widely in the neighborhood that we were obliged to cover up our origin, lest people should have refused to pronounce our names. Slowly, the old man lifted both his arms above his head. His fingers began to twitch convulsively, as though he was trying to catch hold of some imaginary object in the air. He then fell onto the ground. When he came to his sense again, he dragged his sons towards the ruined temple. When they were both inside it, he said, Do you hear any wailing sound? No, I don't, said Brindavan. Just listen very carefully. Do you hear anybody calling out, Father? No. This seemed to relieve him greatly. From that day forward, he used to go about asking people, Do you hear any wailing sound? They laughed at the raving daughter. About four years later, Chagunath lay on his deathbed. When the light of this world was gradually fading away from his eyes and his breathing became more and more difficult, he suddenly sat up in a state of raving. Throwing both his hands in the air, he seemed to group about 
for something muttering nitai who has removed my ladder unable to find the ladder to climb out of his terrible dungeon where there was no light to see and no air to breathe he fell on his bed once more and disappeared into that region where no one has ever been found out in the world's eternal game of hide and seek